scripture reading this morning in relation to the text that we'll be studying. I would like to read from Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33, beginning at verse 50, I'll read through the end of the chapter. Numbers 33:50. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal images and demolish all their high places. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. You shall inherit the land by lot according to your clans. To a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance, and to a small tribe you shall give a small inheritance. Wherever the lot falls for anyone, that shall be his. According to the tribes of your fathers, you shall inherit. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing on our study of his word. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning in the, the name of that one who shall have dominion from land to sea. We come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who even now is putting his enemies under his feet. We ask, Father, for the power of your Holy Spirit to be evident with us this morning as we study your word. We pray that you would give us understanding, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. <coughs> Sanctify us by your truth, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we have a tall task <laughs> before us this morning to cover five chapters in Joshua, chapters 15 through 19. This is the account of Israel doing what the Lord commanded Moses in Numbers chapter 33. And in God's gracious providence, these very passages in Joshua were included in our Ardsley family scripture reading this past week. So if you've been keeping up, uh, then you are already familiar with this section you know all the boundaries of all the <laughs> tribes and all the cities that were allotted to them great job <laughs> for the sake of time we will not be reading the entire section yes i hear that sigh of relief but we will highlight some key points we have the account of the inheritances of the tribes of israel distributed by lot first at Gilgal, and then continuing at Shiloh. Uh, this is admittedly a difficult section to read. It's not the most exciting reading, I'll grant it. Uh, it's a difficult section to preach. The majority of it outlines the borders of the land allotted to the various tribes and lists the cities belonging to those tribes. It can seem like dry reading. And what does this have to do with us here this morning anyway? This was, after all, Israel's inheritance. But we must remember what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which I think can apply here in this context. Paul says, now these things happen to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. In its historical context, these things were written down for Israel's instruction, that they would know the extent 
of the inheritance that the Lord allotted to each of the tribes. This was not only for their reference, it was for their great encouragement. This is the detailed catalog of the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a catalog of God's faithfulness to his promises. Here was where God's people could live and could serve the Lord and worship the Lord and where the Lord would dwell in their very midst. A significant step toward a restored Eden. But, and this is where we come in, it was anticipating something better. It was not an end in itself. We know the tragic story of Israel's repeated unfaithfulness in the land. Even in this section this morning, we will see Israel not always responding to the promises as they should, but instead falling short and needing to be exhorted to take hold of the inheritance that God has graciously allotted to them. But looking at these things with a, with a new covenant understanding in Christ, we see these things were shadows and the substance belongs to Christ. In fact, Galatians tells us that the promises were to Abraham and to his offspring. And then Paul says regarding that offspring, Paul says, referring not to many, but to one who is Christ. We must understand these things in their historical context, yes, but also seek to understand how they find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the true heir, the true offspring of Abraham, and how they find their fulfillment in us who believe in him as his co-heirs. So let's first consider our text, looking at the historical events, and then consider how does this point us to our Lord Jesus Christ. God is allotting the land to Israel according to his promises that he made to the patriarchs. To a large extent, as we've seen, the Canaanites have been defeated and the land has been subdued such that Israel can now take possession of it. And Israel is to go forth in faith and take possession of it, driving out the remaining inhabitants of the land. Regarding the allotment given to Israel, we see that Judah was first. Judah was the first tribe, first on the west side of the Jordan. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. But we're focusing now on the west side of the Jordan. We see the southern portion of Canaan was given to Judah. We see that in chapter 15. And north of Judah, was given to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. We see that in chapters 16 and 17. And this was all done at Gilgal. The other tribes were allotted their portions within, between, and around the land given to Judah and to Joseph. We see that in chapters 18 and 19. And this was done at Shiloh. So we see that Judah comes forward first to receive their inheritance. And we really started to see this uh, last week in chapter 14 as we considered Caleb. If we look back at Joshua chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, these are the inheritances that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot 
just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one half tribes. And then verse 6, Joshua 14, verse 6, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. Caleb enthusiastically asked for his inheritance, and Joshua gave it to him. And Caleb went out in faith and conquered it and took possession of his inheritance within the allotment for Judah. And chapter 15 gives us detailed survey of the boundaries and cities of Judah's inheritance in the land. And their portion is very large. And in chapter 19, in fact, we see that the tribe of Simeon will actually be given a portion within Judah. Judah had such a large portion. Judah gets a large portion with many cities, including Jerusalem. But here we see our first problem. Chapter 15, verse 63. But, but the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Problem. They were supposed to drive out all the inhabitants of Canaan, taking full possession of the land. But here we see Judah could not drive out the Jebusites from Jerusalem. Why not? What's wrong? Why were they unable to drive them out? Well, certainly. This was not the fault of God. No blame can be laid upon God for this failure. God who had commanded them to drive out the inhabitants of the land. God who had, com who had promised them success in driving out the inhabitants of the land. There's no legitimate excuse here for failing to drive the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. John Calvin said, it was owing entirely to their own sluggishness that they did not make themselves master of the city of Jerusalem. It was their neglect of the divine command from a love of ease. Right? They probably got a little complacent, a little... A little too maybe weary and just got tired of the whole thing and neglected to drive the Jebusites out and it was not until many years later after David was anointed king that Jerusalem would be taken from the Jebusites when David went and took it from them In chapters 16 and 17, we have recorded the lot for Joseph, divided between his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Chapter 16, verse 1, says, The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. And then continues describing it. Verse 4, the people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim <coughs> received their inheritance. Now it's interesting to note here in verse 4 how the author identifies the sons of Joseph. He says the people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. Manasseh was Joseph's firstborn, if you remember from Genesis. So Manasseh is naturally listed here first. But we see, when we see the lots falling to the sons of Joseph, 
we see that the lot that fell, we see the lot that fell to Ephraim first. The sons of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim. But then we get Ephraim's lot first, beginning in verse 5. The territory of the people of Ephraim by their clans was as follows. Remember when Jacob blessed Joseph's sons back in Genesis chapter 48, what did he do? He gave the blessing to Ephraim first, putting him before Manasseh, which displeased Joseph because Manasseh was the firstborn, not Ephraim, and Joseph tried to move Jacob's hands. So Joshua here seems to follow the same pattern. Yes, Manasseh is the firstborn, verse 4, but Ephraim's territory is allotted first before Manasseh, verse 5 through the end of chapter 16. But note again, chapter 16, verse 10. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. <clears throat> Another failure. Another failure on the part of Israel in taking possession of their inheritance. They did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Again, why not? Well, perhaps they did not drive them out because of the use they, could, they felt they could make of them. Why devote them to destruction, perhaps they thought, when they seem rather skilled and can be used to our advantage? Well, if they had the power to subject them to forced labor, certainly they had the power to devote them to destruction. But they didn't. We see here they did not obey the Lord's command and failed to fully possess their inheritance. Next we have the allotment to Manasseh. Chapter 17, reading verses 1 and 2. Then the allotment was made to the people of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. To, to Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted Gilead and Bashan because he was a man of war. And allotments were made to the rest of the people of Manasseh by their clans, Abiazir, Helic, Azrael, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemidah. These were the male descendants of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their clans. So the allotment to Manasseh's firstborn, Maker, or Maker, was on the east side of the Jordan. This is the half-tribe of Manasseh that had received their inheritance on the east side. The rest of the sons of Manasseh had their lot on the west side to the north of Ephraim, as is outlined here in chapter 17. <coughs> Regarding Manasseh's allotment, we have this interesting account of the daughters of Zelophehad. We read of them back in Numbers chapter 27. Their father died in the wilderness, but had no sons, only daughters. And his daughters approached Moses and Eleazar the priest and asked for a possession among their father's brothers so that the name of their father would not be taken away. They wanted their father to have a share in the inheritance. And the Lord told Moses, they're right. They're right. And they are to receive an inheritance among their fathers. So here in Joshua chapter 17, verses 3 through 6, they come to Eleazar and to Joshua and they remind them of the Lord's command concerning them. They are asking for their inheritance. And it reminds me somewhat of Caleb. As Caleb came to Joshua 
asking for his inheritance based on the Lord's promise. So the daughters of Zelophehad come to Joshua asking for their inheritance on the basis of God's promise to them. This was bold faith in the promise of God. So Joshua gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. But not all the people of Manasseh had such bold faith as the daughters of Zelophehad did. Chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. We read, Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, cities that were allotted to them, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Again, strong enough to put the Canaanites to forced labor, but not strong enough to utterly drive them out? Here we have another example of unbelief and disobedience on the part of Israel, failing to take full possession of their inheritance. And we see yet another problem. The people of Joseph express discontentment with their inheritance, complaining that it's not enough. They need more. Chapter 17, beginning at verse 14. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me? And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest, and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and of the Rephaim since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, The hill country is not enough for us, yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Shean and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. So they complained about the lot that fell to them, the lot given to them, by the Lord, right? It fell to them by lot, and it was the Lord who determined what inheritance they received. But they were dissatisfied, thinking they should have more. We don't, we don't like the lot that the Lord has given us. They were distrusting, not believing that nothing is too hard for the Lord, even though the Canaanites have tanks these iron chariots. I should have more than what has been allotted to me, they say. They complain that they're not able to take the hill country because of the forest or the plain because the, Car the Canaanites have iron chariots. I should have more than what's been allotted to me. Well, you have the hills. Nope, too many trees. What about the plains? The enemy's too strong. Excuses that cannot square with the fact that the Lord has indeed blessed them, as they said, and has promised to be with them and give them success. They had forgotten the words of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 17 to 21. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, 
But you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. A great and awesome God. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Right? How soon they forgot those words. How soon they forgot the, what the Lord had, had powerfully done for them. And so Joshua had to exhort them to take the land allotted to them. Joshua said, you are a numerous people. He uses their own argument against them. You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only. The hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it. Go clear it. Go possess it to its farthest borders, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, but they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. So we have the allotment for Judah, we have the allotment for the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And now before we have the allotment of the remaining tribes, we have in, in the middle of our passage this morning, in the, in the middle of this whole section, we have these great words of fulfillment and blessing. Here is the crown of their inheritance, chapter 18, verse 1. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. The whole congregation of the people, all the tribes of Israel, assembled there in Shiloh. This was a solemn and glorious occasion. There they set up the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, the place where they would meet with God. Here we have the people of God in the very midst of their inheritance assemble before the Lord where the Lord will now dwell in their midst. Though not stated directly here, the choice of Shiloh being the place where the tabernacle would be set up at this time was in fact directed by the Lord. Jeremiah uh, chapter 7, uh, be beginning of verse 12, God says, Go now to my place that was in Shiloh. Right? Many years later, in the days of Jeremiah, God says, Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first. Right, this was God's choice. This is where God had determined at that time to make his name dwell. It recalls the words of Deuteronomy chapter 12, but when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from your enemies, <coughs> around so that you live in safety then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there there you shall bring all that I command you your burnt offerings and your sacrifices your tithes and the contribution that you present and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord 
and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants and your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns. Right? That's what we have going on here. The establishment of this at, Chil at Shiloh. Now they are living in relative safety. The Canaanite strongholds have been defeated. The Canaanite kings have been slaughtered. The end of verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1 says, The land lay subdued before them. And so all the people gathered together to rejoice before the Lord and to set his name there as God had commanded in Deuteronomy 12. And Shiloh was an ideal location for this. Shiloh was located in the land of Ephraim. It was about eight hours north of Jerusalem. It was more <laughs> central in the land than even Jerusalem was. Shiloh means rest. The end of chapter 14 says the land had rest from war. A picture, a shadow of Eden being restored. God dwelling in the midst of his people at peace and at rest. Dwelling with his people at peace and at rest. This was a good time to acknowledge that the Lord has been with them and has brought them safely into the land and given them possession of it. And the people would go to Shiloh year after year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord. We find this in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah brought the boy Samuel to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Here the ark would rest until Eli's sons sinned and God brought judgment and the ark was captured by the Philistines. We read in the remainder of chapter 18 and through chapter 19 that here at Shiloh, the lots would be cast for the seven remaining tribes of Israel that have not yet received their inheritance. <coughs> But we encounter yet another problem. Joshua has to rebuke the seven remaining tribes for their sluggishness. Chapter 18, verses 2 through 7, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, how long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? Provide three men from each tribe, and I will send them out that they may set out and go up and down the land. They shall write a description of it with a view to their inheritances, and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So we see these seven tribes have been dragging their feet, not taking possession of the land that the Lord had given them. The King James Version says they were slack. They were being sluggish about it. <coughs> They did not know where their inherent inheritance would be, and yet they didn't seem too concerned to know and to go take possession of it. They did not come to Joshua asking for it. 
Joshua had to exhort them. So Joshua instructs them to survey the land that remains to be allotted. And Joshua casts lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And this, this fact that the lots were cast in Shiloh before the Lord is stated several times throughout this passage, emphasizing the fact that these allotments have been determined by the Lord. These are given to them by the Lord. Now, we won't take the time to go through the allotments of these seven tribes, but we'll jump ahead to the close of chapter 19, where we find Joshua's inheritance. We started with Caleb's last week in chapter 14, right? Caleb being part of the tribe of Judah. So we saw Caleb's inheritance first. Now we're going to see Joshua's inheritance last. And everything else came in between these two great heroes of faith, Caleb and Joshua. So Joshua chapter 19, verses 49 and 50. When they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, Timnath Sira, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled in it. Now note that Joshua received his inheritance last of all. He was the last one to receive his inheritance. He received it only after he had ensured that all Israel had received their inheritance. Right? He wasn't about to go take his inheritance until he had made sure that all Israel had received their inheritance. What a true servant of the Lord Joshua was. And his inheritance, we see, was in the hill country of Ephraim. We see that the Lord gave him the city that he asked for as his inheritance. Caleb was given what he asked for. The daughters of Zelophehad were given what they had asked for. And Joshua was given what he asked for. These are great examples of true faith desiring what the Lord has promised and seeking it and asking for it. And chapter 19 closes with these words, verse 51. These are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. <clears throat> so they finished dividing the land. The Lord was faithful to his word. Entirely faithful. Though the people were not entirely faithful to go and possess what the Lord had given them, God was faithful. God gave it to them. So, what does any of this have to do with us this morning? Well, I think we must see the inheritance of the land in its context in the unfolding of redemptive history. We must see it in its context in the unfolding of redemptive history. And we must view it centered in Jesus Christ, who is the center of all things. We must view it as part of the plan of redemption, the plan of redemption leading up to the incarnation of the Son of God, born as a man from the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, the Son of David, 
the son of Abraham. This was the land of his humiliation, where he lived as a servant in perfect obedience to the Father, obedience even to the cross. This was the land in which he would be crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. This is the land from where he would ascend into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God. The land functions typologically. When we look at, at the New Testament, we see that the land functions typologically, pointing us to a better country, pointing us forward to something better, pointing us to a world redeemed by Jesus Christ with God dwelling in the midst of a redeemed humanity, in the midst of a people who are truly at rest. It is Jesus Christ, the book of Hebrews tells us, it is Jesus Christ, not Joshua, who gives us true rest. The new covenant in Jesus Christ enlarges the tent, bringing the nations into the family of Abraham. Right, Isaiah chapter 54, the prophet tells Israel, you're going to need a bigger tent. You're going to need to enlarge the tent. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 4 that the promise to Abraham and his offspring was that he would be heir of the world. He would be heir of the world. Again, Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that Christ is the offspring of Abraham to whom the promises were made. The inheritance was promised to him ultimately. And Paul says that we who are united to Jesus Christ by faith, we who have faith in Jesus Christ are heirs with Christ. We are sons of Abraham. We are, as Paul says, heirs according to promise. We are the heirs of the promises to Abraham given to Christ. And as Caleb and Joshua and the daughters of Zelophehad asked for their inheritance, so Jesus asked for his inheritance from the Father after his resurrection and ascension. Psalm 2, God says to his son, whom he has set as king on his holy hill of Zion. God says to him, ask of me, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Ask of me. The nations are his heritage. The ends of the earth are his possession. Israel's going to need a bigger tent. Jesus instructed his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 saying, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. Hebrews 9.15 tells us that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. In Christ, we have an eternal inheritance. Right? This idea of inheritance, 
looked forward, looked forward to something far better, looked forward to something far superior in its fulfillment in Christ. We have a promised eternal inheritance that is received by faith, the faith of Abraham. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked beyond the land of promise to a better country, a heavenly one. They looked to a land of fulfillment, not of types and shadows. This inheritance, this promised eternal inheritance that is ours in Christ includes eternal life in that better country, in, that, in a renewed world, in a physical land that is heavenly in nature. It's a physical land, but it's a heavenly one. It's heavenly in nature. It's free from all sin. It's where God's will is done perfectly. It's the home of righteousness. It's the land wherein is the throne of God and of the Lamb in the city with foundations whose designer and builder is God. We come to Shiloh and we rest and we rejoice in what the Lord has done for us. This is our inheritance and this is what Israel's inheritance foreshadowed, looked forward to something bigger, something better. And the question for us is, do we desire that inheritance? Do we earnestly desire to take possession of that inheritance? Inheriting the promises is something that should be on the forefront of our minds. It should be in our hearts. Are we longing now for the home of righteousness? Weary of our sin, eager to be set free from its presence in our lives and to have the Lord dwelling in our midst and to see his face. Do we value our inheritance like Caleb and Joshua valued theirs? like the daughters of Zelophehad valued theirs? Or have, have we become too distracted or too comfortable in this world? The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus will appear a second time to bring salvation to those who are eagerly waiting for him. Those who are eagerly waiting for him. Are we eagerly waiting for him? Are we eager to inherit the promises? Let us not be sluggish about obtaining our inheritance as a number of the tribes of Israel were sluggish, seemingly not too interested in obtaining it. Again, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 6, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That you may not be sluggish. The writer of Hebrews is trying to, to warn them against sluggishness concerning the promised etern eternal inheritance. Do not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We inherit the promises through faith and patient waiting. But at the same time, there is to be an earnest striving, an earnest striving to enter God's rest, an earnest striving to have as the author says in chapter 6, the full assurance of hope until the end. The full assurance of hope. The desire and expectation, 
Hope. Hope has, has, has with it desire and expectation. We're to have the full assurance of hope firm until the end. Desire and expectation for the inheritance of salvation. Hardship and difficulty and persecution can tempt us to lose hope. And sin can lead us astray. Sin can lead us to go astray in our hearts and seek other things than this promised eternal inheritance. And so we are to fight doubt and despair. And we are to war against our sin. We are to hold fast to Jesus firm to the end, holding a firm conviction as to the truthfulness of the gospel, a firm conviction as to the certainty that Jesus loves us, that Jesus saves us, that Jesus completely forgives us, that he makes us his co-heirs, and that he brings us safely to glory, that he brings us to that inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. We are told as New Covenant believers in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 35, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I trust that's true of each and every one of us, that we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of study in your word this morning. We thank you for the Savior that you've given to us, the one who, who rightfully is the rightful heir of all of your promises. And we thank you that you have made us co-heirs in him, uniting us to him by faith, making us sons of Abraham and heirs according to promise. Help us, Father, to be earnest, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, not being sluggish, but being imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We thank you for the inheritance that you have waiting for us, one that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and we give you our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.